Welcome to the HMO Property Show by investors for investors. Brought to you by the HMO Property Co., Australia's leaders in impact investing. Investments made with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a positive financial return. Catch us weekly as we discuss all things cash flow positive property investing. Welcome back to the Here Tomorrow Property Show. I'm your host, Neil Gibb, and today I want to talk to you about the current state of the rental market, not just in Perth, but all across Australia, because Anglicare Australia have just released their new rental affordability snapshot, and then off the back of their rental affordability snapshot, they released their essential workers report, which now shows from research that these guys have done, the people that are now in need of accommodation in Australia. Now, I'm gonna give you a little list of people right now. So, aged care workers, cleaners, dispatchers, hospitality workers, postal workers, social and community service workers, ambulance officers, construction workers, firefighters, meat packers, retail workers, child care workers, delivery drivers, freight drivers, nurses and school teachers are covered and classed as the essential workers in the report that they've just re- just released. Now let's just look at three of them for instance, nurses, school teachers and ambulance officers. Where would we be without them three types of workers right now? Yet they are the people that are getting priced out of the market because the market is getting out of control. So the 2023 rental affordability snapshots that was released uh, says that Australians are facing a rental market that has never been less affordable. The 2023 rental affordability snapshot surveyed rental listings across Australia and found that affordability has crashed to record lows. Now, on the night that they did this, or at the time that they did this, there were 45,895 rental listings across Australia. And they found that 345 rentals, which was 0.8%, was affordable for a person earning a full-time minimum wage. Minimum wage. 345 rentals out of 45,000. Now, I don't know about you, but I've just had little Freddy. He's granted he's only 10 months. It's going to be a while before he gets his own place. But how expensive is real estate going to be by the time my son is 18, 19, 20 and he leaves the house and wants to create his own independence? Where's he going to live? How's he going to afford to do this? It's pretty scary, the state of the market right now. And what's happening is the price of real estate is increasing a lot faster than wages are increasing. Um, so it's just going to get more and more unaffordable for people. Now, out of the 45,895 rental listings, 162 rentals, which was 0.4%, were affordable for a person on the aged pension. 66 rentals, 0.1%, were affordable for a person on the disability support pension. And four rentals, 0% of all share houses, were affordable for a person on job seeker and zero rentals were affordable for a person on a youth allowance. So this was just on the um, the rental affordability snapshot. So just so I can give you some more context on this. Um, I've got the report in front of me, it's quite hefty. And what I'll do guys, I'll put it in the actual show notes so you can check it out. Um, so the rental affordability snapshot focused on essential workers and we found that the situation is a little better for people in secure jobs providing essential services that support the livability and well-being of our communities the housing crisis is climbing the rungs the rungs of the income ladder once upon a time renting was a temporary housing solution before buying your first home now with houses prices with housing prices putting home purchases out of the reach of many more Australians, God, I can't read today, guys, my apologies. Now, with housing prices putting home purchases out of reach for many, more Australians are renting in the long term. But rental regulations and agreements are not recognising the new long-term reality of renting. 
and rents are rising rapidly. In the past year, rents have risen on average by 11%, whilst wages have only grown 3.7%. Housing costs are growing faster than the pace of wages. Now, during the pandemic, we were reminded just how crucial certain jobs are to health and well-being of our community. And in this report, we examine whether people working in these 16 essential jobs are able to afford rental properties in any region across the country. The report showed that the lowest paid workers on the list, including retail workers, cleaners and early childhood educators, can only afford about 1% of the nearly 46,000 property surveys. School teachers and firefighters were the most likely to be able to find affordable rentals, yet still only 3% of listings were affordable for school teachers and firefighters. Now, what we are seeing in the HMO market right now is a shift, a massive shift. And it's probably because our rooms have got better and our prices have increased as, as, increased as well. But we're seeing a huge change in the jobs and the demographic of the people renting our rooms. We've got a um, cybersecurity professional earning a staggering amount of money renting a room from us in a HMO. Um, here, two things. Couldn't find a normal rental. Didn't want to live in his home because he worked from home. So working from home can be quite lonely at times. He can drive you up the wall. So he likes to work at home. And then at the end of the day, he's got people to socialize with. Um, we are seeing, oh God, it's just yeah, crazy at the minute out there, guys. Absolutely crazy. Right, so what's class as affordable? So for people on low to moderate incomes, rent must not exceed 30% of a household budget for it not to cause financial stress and difficult choices. This is an internationally accepted and utilized benchmark based on many years of study into the impact of the cost of living and how it affects people. And this is the benchmark that Anglicare Australia uses. To test whether a lifting, listing is affordable, we calculate the net income for each category of essential workers using the Consolidated Modern Award for the Fair Work Commission. Our calculations assume full-time employment. All workers are assumed to be fully qualified, not working as trainees or apprentices. All workers are assumed to be earning adult wages rather than use wages, and award wages are taking at 1st of April 2023 to remain consistent with the weekend on which the properties were advertised in March 2023. So although this podcast is being recorded in November, it obviously takes a lot of time to collate all this information, review it, package it up and produce a report on it. Um, for the purposes of the snapshot, a room in a share house or in a bedsit is considered suitable for a single person. Advertisements for housing in retirement village and student accommodation are excluded from the snapshot, as are advertisements for holiday accommodation. Advertisements which refer to multiple properties but do not indicate how many were available are, for the purposes of the snapshot, counted as two properties. Advertisements which include a condition such as child mining or other employment type activities are also not included. So I think it's quite important to um, point out the difference between a room in a share house or bed sit, um, but student accommodation is excluded. So the bed sit is included and then student accommodation is not included. So student accommodation is student is accommodation on campus. Um, there might be share houses around universities which have been included in the list. So they've actually considered um, like accommodation outside of campuses. Now, the problem that we might be seeing here is not a lot of people, and I don't know if they've used realestate.com, flatmates, Gumtree, Facebook Marketplace. Um, I don't think it actually talks about what platforms they actually used. But either way, the results are pretty staggering. I mean, aged care workers, ambulance officers, cleaners, construction workers, delivery drivers, early childhood educators, Freight drivers, hospitality workers, nurses, postal workers, retail workers, school teachers, social and community services workers. I mean, they would be ideal tenants, wouldn't they? If you had an investment property and you could say, I would love to rent this out to this profession or this is the demographic that I would like to do or these are the people that I'd like to live in these houses. Like these are the people that keep the country moving, yet they are struggling to find accommodation. So if you're coming into work into one of these essential roles, yet 
you're sleeping at your friend's house or you're about to sleep in your car. Like, how can you be focused going into the workplace and not worrying about what's going on outside of the property, uh, what's going on outside of the, of the workplace? Like, accommodation is a basic human right. Everybody should be able to get access to accommodation. It's the, it's the vision of our, of our business. We see a world where everybody has access to housing because it's a basic human right. How can we not have access to housing in one of the best countries on the planet? It's absolutely incredible. We're something like 680,000 properties, 640,000 um, houses short right now across Australia to meet demand right now, which is staggering. So when we look at the, when we break it down in the, um, the percentages of the actual workers themselves, so of the 45,895 rental listings, I'm just going to put my phone on silent guys because it keeps bouncing quite a bit. Sorry about that. Podcast etiquette 101. Put your phone on. Do not disturb. Right. So back to the podcast. Um, of the 45,895,000 000 rental listings, 1,087 rentals were affordable for an ambulance worker. How can an ambulance worker not find access to housing? They rush into an emergency. They haven't had a good night's sleep because they're sleeping at a friend's house or they're sleeping in the car or they're sleeping in a tent somewhere. It just blows my mind that this is happening out there and we've got an opportunity to fix this. Yet people are still investing and building in three, four and five bedroom houses and renting them out to one person and creating more and more unaffordable accommodation for people. Absolutely staggering. 666 rentals were affordable for a nurse. 666 rentals out of 45,000 rentals were affordable for a nurse. 582 rentals were affordable for a construction worker. 507 rentals were affordable for an aged care worker. 428 rentals were affordable for an early childhood educator. And 424 rentals were affordable for a hospitality worker. It's just absolutely staggering. Um... So since 2011, the proportion of essential workers in the private rental sector has increased, particularly among essential workers under the age of 40. Most essential workers have a place of work that they must travel to and on average they are forced to live 30 kilometres away from their place of work due to affordability, which causes more, further financial and health well-being stress on those people and their families. And this is what I was just talking about. With the HMO, we give the option... We give people the option to live in areas that they want to live in, but sometimes can't afford to live in because A, there's not enough rentals in these properties or these suburbs right now, but we can build a property in these areas, rent the rooms out for cheaper than what it would do to rent a full house. And then you've got people that can live and work in the same area. So they don't have to travel an hour each way when they're going to work. Um, for some workers on call or who work night shifts longer commutes can make a significant impact not only on their quality of life but on their ability to do their jobs there's an essential worker shortage crisis too for example more than 100,000 aged disability and mental health care workers will be needed within the next decade as the sector tries to meet the growing demand for care 100,000 in just one industry Employers are unable to fill vacancies, leaving shifts vacant and essential work not done. Now, recently we've had some, um, what are they called, recruitment companies reach out to us asking if they can take uh, leases on properties uh, for their workers that they want to bring in. So they're not essentially bringing them in for themselves. They're bringing them in for other other companies to then use in their businesses. Um so what we've said to them is, why don't the businesses themselves build some accommodation, a HMO, and we can manage it for them, start to finish? More importantly, why don't you as a recruitment agent build a HMO? Again, we'll take care of it all for you. We'll leave the property vacant specifically for your clients or your client's employees. And then when you bring them in, you've always got accommodation there for them. Then they can find the feet. Once they get some regular income coming in, they can then go out and get their own accommodation. 
So that's something else we're working on in the background as well. Um, boom. The complex problem and the burden of solutions is being passed to employees and or governments to enable the socio-economic development of local communities. For example, some employers are being forced to subsidise housing just to secure enough workers, which is essentially what I've just mentioned there. The We've spoken to the Wheat Belt Development Commission recently. Um, they are interested in what we do. They want some of our housing in the Wheat Belt. The problem that we've got is uh, the Wheat Belt is huge. <laughs> uh, the biggest town in the Wheat Belt, I believe, is Northam. And even that's just a small town with just over 20,000 properties or 20,000 people living there. So it's relatively small. And also the cost of land in these areas is relatively cheap, like 50, 60 grand. But it's still costing five, 600 grand to build a house there because it's regional and it costs more to get properties built in these areas. Um, so for anybody to build in these areas, a normal property, for instance, if they build a three by two, um, instantly they will be underwater because it's going to cost them 500, 550, 600 grand to build these properties, but it's only going to be valued at 350, 400 by the banks from comparable sales in the area. So it's a tough, tough gig in these regional areas. Regional areas are struggling big time right now. Um, Anglicare Australia Network member and aged care provider Benitas has reported independent living units in regional Victoria, as uh, sorry, has repurposed independent living units in regional Victoria to make it possible for aged care workers struggling to afford rentals in the local market or commuting from Melbourne to maintain their employment. Now, again, we've said it again, it's Living in Metro is great if you're working in Metro, but if you're traveling from Metro to regional on a daily basis, whether that's Perth, whether that's Victoria, whether that's New South Wales or Queensland, that's a big drive, guys. That's a lot of time spent in your car. Now, you can use that time in your car to increase your knowledge. You can listen to podcasts, you can listen to audio books, you can do all these things. Um, but at the same time, it's still a, a big slog, especially when we need these essential workers to be sharp when they're in the workplace because they're, they're essential. Uh, a local government in Western Australia has purchased properties and is looking to build more to provide housing for workers. The tourism industry is being encouraged to find its own solutions to workforce shortages by building staff accommodation. Back to the story about the Wheat Belt Development Commission, just so I can close that loop for you. Um, when we sat down with the... Uh, the CEO and the GM of the Development Commission, they said that one of the biggest grain or um, they are a grain provider, well, essentially agriculture, so a CBH group they're called, they said that they can't employ people right now because there's no accommodation to put these workers in. They say that it's costing them $250,000 a year in opportunity cost by not having these people working for them so they're losing out on 250,000 per person not working for them staggering as you can see like the the problem is complex and increasingly becoming more and more significant it's only going to get worse guys we've just had another rate increase from the from the um rba because inflation cpi is running a little bit high again um it's bonkers to see the sydney market on a run again absolutely bonkers i believe there's just a lot of overseas cash coming into sydney at the minute um, i've been speaking to a lot of people to try and find out how that market is moving when a lot of people cannot access equity from their properties because they're struggling to refinance because the interest rates are so high at the minute so it's a lot of cash at the three million dollar plus mark that's moving that market and dragging it up um, but the rent of, rental housing affordability is climbing the rungs of the household income ladder and is now severely, severely affecting people on moderate incomes, 40 to 60% population average of household income. 40 to 60% population average of household income. <coughs> There's a massive problem here, guys. We can fix it. I'm doing my best. <laughs> but we need help. We need help from investors. Um, I don't mind whether you buy, a th if you do a three by two or a four by two, or you come and work with us. Um, 
But what we need to do is build more housing. Buying housing is good. I get it. Everybody's trying to line their own pockets and invest for their own future. But I think sometimes when we're buying established properties, we're actually taking away, we're taking more property from the market. We're actually adding to the problem. We're adding to the problem and we need to be building more properties. Um, got a bit more on the crisis for the workers. So between 2018 and 2021, the number of available rentals listed was consistently above 65,000. Australia's vacancy rate remains at the lowest rate on record at 0.8%. The market for affordable properties is fiercely competitive with many people unable to get a look in to a rental. We have heard reports about people queuing down the street for inspections, competing with dozens or even hundreds of other potential renters. Landlords and agents can be more selective and offer often prefer applicants with higher incomes. Housing is the largest fixed cost for most Australian households with so few affordable rentals available, many people have no choice but to pay more than they can afford to keep a roof over their heads. The essential workers identified in Table 1, which are the guys that have just been mentioned a few times now, are vital to the functioning, livability and well-being of our communities. We are dependent on them to provide emergency services, healthcare, food and groceries to teach our children and take care of all the Australians. Since 2011, the proportion of essential workers in the private rental sector has increased, particularly among essential workers under the age of 40. Uh, financial stress can impact the mental well-being of essential workers and exacerbate the stress that is already inherent in many of their jobs. And this has the potential to impact the quality of care and safety of their work. While rental prices saw, Australia is also grappling with a workforce crisis. Key industries are struggling to find enough staff to meet requirements. For example, more than 100,000 age, disability and mental health care workers will be needed within the next decade as the sector tries to meet the growing demand for care. Absolutely bonkers. Um, I went to a dinner, a luncheon at uh, the UDIA. We had Tanya Steinbeck from the UDIA on the podcast not too long ago. And we went to a pod, uh, podcast, we went to a dinner and uh, Honourable John Carey was there talking about all these levers that he's pulling and these houses that he's building. And look, he's giving it a good nudge, but all John Carey's focused on right now is social housing. <clears throat> and there's a difference between social housing and affordable housing. Uh, social housing, we all know what it is. Affordable housing is generally housing that's run by um, community housing providers. And then we've got the private rental affordable housing, which is the HMO, shared accommodation, shared spaces. Then you've got the private rental market. So when you look at them four quadrants, private rental market can be anything from $400 a week up to, yeah, sky's the limit really, 1,000, 1,500, two grand a week. Um, affordable private rental is HMO. So anything from 200 bucks a week for a room with a shared bathroom, up to, we've got rooms right now for over 400 bucks a week now. So, uh, and then you've got your community housing providers. Now the problem with community housing providers is it's government run. So they don't have um, property managers like a Ray White, LJ Hooker, a j and Property Group, for instance. They don't have property managers like this who want to grow their business, managing these properties and making sure they've got good systems and processes in place. A lot of these government run agencies are, what's the right word without making this sound bad? They haven't got the drive that a, that a business owner will have, for instance, because it's funded by the government. And I've worked in government before, it's, it's a different mindset. Hope I'm not gonna frustrate anybody or trigger anybody there. Um, but I believe if community housing providers were privately run rather than government run be a lot a lot, lot different right so they're talking about social housing here a lot um the undersupply let me just take a step back here over the years housing supply has been positioned as the default answer to housing affordability it is the favored solution of the development industry property commentators and the real estate industry Yet the reality is that Australia has an oversupply of dwellings compared to its needs and demographics. Between 
165,000 and 240,000 new dwellings are already built across the country each year. Increasing supply in the private market is simply filled, filled to make housing more affordable. <clears throat> Let's think about that. Why is that? Because everyone keeps building the same crap. Everyone keeps building a 4x2 in Baldivis or Alcamos or Ellenbrook. Like, I've got nothing against these suburbs, but at least build something that the market needs. Not that some shiny salesman has told you that a 4x2 is always going to go up in value because everybody else builds them. If you don't build it, then you'll never get the resale value that everybody else will. Bollocks. I'm sorry. Excuse my French, but it's absolute crap. We sell, we've sold three HMOs since 2017. They've all sold for higher than anything else selling in the market. So it's absolute garbage. If you build a product that's in demand, that's different to what everybody else is building, and it's affordable for the people that need it, the demand is going to be through the roof for it. The last downturn that happened in Perth, we had a lot of vacant properties, 7% vacancy rate at the time compared to 0.6 now. But what was empty? All of these 4 by 2s that people keep building. Mandurah, Alcamos, Baldivis, like they were just like ghost towns because no one wanted to live there because there was too many four by twos or too many of the same properties to choose from. But we had it, we had properties in some of these areas and the rooms were affordable. The houses were filled and renting out for almost three times as much as all the rest of the houses that were sat there vacant. So if you're building the right property, I believe that statement is wrong. Increasing supply in the private market has simply failed to make housing more affordable. I think increasing supply of the right product in the private market would well and truly make housing more affordable. Supplying the same garbage is the problem. The undersupply is not in housing, but in social and affordable housing. Now, we talk about what they're classing as affordable housing run by community housing providers. The shortage of affordable rentals for low-income households grew between 1996 and 2011, contradicting the theory that housing supply in the private market would trickle down and create affordable rentals over time. Australia now has more dwellings per head of population than at any other time in the country, and yet affordability is the lowest it's ever been. Australia now has more dwellings per head of population than any other time in our history. So why is it unaffordable? We've In the last ABS results, they, they reckon now that 2.3% uh, sorry, uh, 2.3 is the average household size. So just over two people on average living in a property. Yeah, all over the country, we've got these four bedroom, two bathroom, double lockup garage, theatre room, games room. Like, again, we've just been building the wrong product, guys. This this report is just, <clears throat> it's exactly that. Everything that I've been complaining about and mourning about and standing on my soapbox about and trying to tell everybody, like, we've been doing it wrong. And I'm not saying the HMO is the only answer to this, but it's one of many good answers. It, and it, let's be honest, like it's changing a lot for a lot of people. We've got over 600 people in beds now. We've worked with over 200 investors now and like every one of their lives has been changed because they're investing in a product that's going up in value while they're getting positive cash flow and they're providing affordable accommodation for people that need it most. Like it's pretty satisfying when you lie in bed at night knowing that you're helping nurses, firefighters, ambulance drivers etc get access to housing so they can go to work and run the country for us uh once upon a time the australian government viewed a, viewed housing as an essential service and took a direct interest in its provision however over the course of the last 40 years housing has been privatized and social housing stocks have dwindled state and territory governments now have very little public housing stock yet demand has not dropped Waiting lists for social housing as the highest they've been in a decade to the point that public housing is only for those in deepest crisis. Now, this problem is too big for the government to fix and I get it. Some of these government runs or not-for-profit agencies will look to the government for help. But the private market, like, we can make such an impact and make some good money at the same time, guys. Like, it's incredible. In order to merely maintain the current ratio of social housing on the, on the market, we would need to be building 15,000 new social homes year on year to close the current shortfall. We would need an additional 10,000 each year on top of that to cover the next two decades. 
10,000 every year. Wow. As it stands, we build around 3,000 new social homes every year. This is clearly inadequate to meet the demand. Now, John Kerry was saying he's he's spending 2.5 billion to build 3,000 social homes. It's not bad. 3,000 social homes, 2.5 billion. Why was that? Surely we can use that a little bit better. We've we've modeled it up, right? We can build with a billion dollars. We can build seven hundred and ninety HMOs, and we can build twenty four. Let's call them like small developments, like ten, twelve, fifteen bedroom HMOs, right? For a billion dollars, we can house five thousand nine hundred people. But for uh, $2.5 billion, the government are going to house 3,000 people. So half the price, double the amount of people. Again, like it's too big for the government to fix, guys. This is your chance to step in. Uh, also, in the um, Angry Care Australia report, they talk about creating a fairer tax system <clears throat> and providing more protection for renters. I'll leave it all open for you guys to have a skeg through this and uh, have a read through it yourself. It's actually a really, really interesting read. I printed it out, highlighted bits of it, scribbled all over it. Um, it's really, really good. So I hope that helps, guys. Just thought I'd share that with you. As always, you can tell I'm very passionate about this, solving this problem, providing housing for people. Um, if you've got any questions, hit me up. If you uh, don't agree with something in this report, hit me up. Love to have a chat with you about it. Um, if you know anybody from Ang- Anglicare who put this report together, who'd love to have a chat, let me know. I'd love to reach out to them and see if they want to come on the podcast and we can delve deeper into this. So as always, guys, I will leave this with you. And if you ever used to listen to my other podcast, uh, the Perth Entrepreneurs Podcast, I used to finish with this saying, every master was once a disaster and every winner was once a beginner. Thanks for listening. Make sure you tune in the same time next week so you stay up to date with all the cash flow positive property updates.